It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. So you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. So you might be wondering, how do you get to ask questions? All you have to do is use the question panel on the right of GoToWebinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter to submit your questions with the hashtag Event Icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Now, without any further delay, this is hashtag event icons with your hosts, Will Curran of Endless Events, Laura Lopez of Social Tables, and Brant Kruger of Event Technology Consulting. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Event Icons. It is the weekly show where you can ask the events industry icons anything. So uh, I'm Laura Lopez of Social Tables. I'm joined here with Brant. Brant, welcome. Hello. And then uh, we have a special guest today. Today's show is about safety with event stages and structures. Um, and so we have Stageline Mobile Stage Inc. And we are joined by, uh, with Pierre. Hello, Pierre. Welcome to the show. Hey, hello. How are you? Good, good. Um, Pierre, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your role at uh, Stageline? Uh, so I am commercial director at Stageline. I, I drive all of our operations for the, our rental business and our uh, selling business as well of selling stages. All we do is super vertical. We do mobile hydraulic stages that are used for outdoor events. So every year uh, we will do roughly around 1,500 events all around North America, Canada and the U.S., sometimes in Mexico, some tours, some small projects and a ton of bigger projects as well. Uh, so we do a lot of in and outs of concerts, festivals, street fairs, uh, live events. That's our business. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day awesome. basis. I solve a ton of problems. <laughs> that's, cool. I try to. that's good. That's good. Um, <laughs> and Pierre, what got you into the events industry? Take us, take us back. Um, I have an engineering background, so it's basically a life and destiny, destiny pushed me into this business. That's a lot of us probably around the table or around the webinar, whatever you say it, however you say it. So uh, it's really pure luck. So I had a contact who like connected me to Stageline and said, you know, there's a perfect fit. You enjoy music, live events. You obviously don't like to share like just to shave like Brent on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Uh, keep it scruffy a little bit, you know, and uh, you know, I, I didn't want to work in a suit and tie, so uh, it was a perfect fit. I travel tons. I like to see. I wanted to see the world, and so it was a great opportunity and kind of a good combination of uh, all my interests with the need of the company. So, uh, and it's kind of an addictive industry, as you all probably know. So it's kind of a bit of a drug that you get a taste of putting it all together, seeing the magic of people showing up and like the event happening and then uh, the end of it. Like, And on our end, in the staging world, we're always the first in and the last one out. So we see it all from basically an empty field or an empty uh, street corner at 2 a.m. in the morning till the next 2 a.m. in the morning the following day once everything's done. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then it, I love this question. We ask this of all of our uh, our guests. Uh, if you weren't in the events industry, um, what do you think you would be doing otherwise? That's a really, really good question. And uh, obviously, I didn't look at a lot of <laughs> pre-planned questions. So I don't have an <laughs> answer to any <laughs> questions. So I don't know. I want to say a uh, male stripper or a professional, uh, <laughs> professional dancer. Yeah, uh, Brent and I could start a business. We'd be doing very well. Uh, oh yeah. Well, honestly, yeah. I have no no serious answer to to that question. Um, never even crossed my mind. I mean, uh, we're, I'm pretty happy at what I'm doing here. Actually, very happy at what I'm doing here and how things are going. So I didn't I didn't think of another career path. So. 
That's my answer. <laughs> awesome. I've, I've heard our industry referred to as the corporate freight elevator. So you don't have to wear a suit and tie all the time. You can let the beard grow out a little bit, but it involves a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. That's a good way of putting it for sure. So um, I don't, I, I'm going to just uh, bear my soul for, for one second. Um, I actually know very little about the stage industry. Um, I do go to events. I host events as well, but I uh, don't really know a lot about it. So um, tell us a little bit, maybe the basics of what a planner needs to know about stage safety. Um, and then we'll kind of go into maybe if you could tell us a little bit about maybe like basic laws or regulations. I know you're not a lawyer, but just kind of like basics that planners should know about when hiring um, a stage company. It really depends what you're doing, if you're going indoors or outdoors, because it's really two different worlds. But uh, the basics of, of staging uh, and safety is basically getting getting a certified product. So you're, you should be getting from your vendor certification that are stamped by a professional engineer of the products that you're getting with all the, the definition of all the characteristics and specifications for the product. If you don't get that, or if you have challenges getting it, well, that's a huge like kind of flashing trigger that like it's an alarm signal basically. Um, from there, um, your your vendor or the person you're working with should be asking a lot of questions to make sure that your needs are covered in terms of characteristics, size, uh, duration of your event, uh, time frame to set it up. If you're on what type of ground you're building, if you're indoor, outdoor, obviously. Um, and also the the rigging plan. So uh, a stage almost always entails an, ob an overhead rigging structure. So therefore you have production, sound, lights, speakers, screens. They're all very heavy with LED screens nowadays. Uh, and that is all flown over, over people's head. So mm -hmm. having a pre-approved rigging plan is also an important criteria. If, like if you should be asked what it is you want to do and accomplish with the product that you're getting. So that's also another very important question to for your vendor to ask or for you to say, well, this is what I want to do as a planner. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. So I need a structure that uh, will deliver that and that you are also able to stamp and say by a professional engineer always, well, this will do the job, will do the trick and under what conditions. Um, that's kind of my second point. My <laughs> third point is an operational management plan. Uh, so your your staging components and your staging vendors should be involved or uh, yeah involved in a part of your safety plan, your overall safety plan for your evacuation routes, for what are you doing in case of high winds, so your high wind action plans, uh, fire. So what's happening in case of fire? What's your egress, entrance, egress, whatever. And um, so that should all be tied into that. And they should also have a predefined high wind action plan. So if they're not able to provide that, that's also another big alarm signal that be on the lookout for a new vendor. Now, most of the um, staging that you guys do is mobile. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Uh, but but we're not just talking about little trucks anymore. I mean, we're talking about basically full-on massive, uh, like what you'd see at concerts and things like that, right? Correct. So we have a full line of product ranging from small platforms, 20 by 16, uh, that go all the way up to 130 by over 60 feet in depth with more than 60 feet in overall trim height with more than 200,000 pounds of rigging capacity. So 200,000 pounds is a pretty serious concert. Uh, as you can imagine, for like national hacks or international acts, uh, Metallica, Radiohead, Red Hot Chili Peppers, whoever you have in mind, could play on those larger larger structures. Um, the 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 characteristics of our product on our end is they are all trailer based, so they integrate four different technologies. They are a, a road legal trailer that will travel down the road, uh, and respect all the DOT regulations that. The, the same way your, your car or uh, vehicle needs to, to respond to. Then we are uh, obviously a mechanical structure that will unfold hydraulically into a stage platform. 
So there's all the hydraulic components to, it's like a gigantic transformer basically, um, or a real life transformer as we like to say. And the third one is we will be a temporary building. So that kind of touches base on your question, Laura, your previous question of rules and regulation. So all of our products are based on the international building codes. So as far as the, uh, the capacity of the structure and all their resistance and characteristics, they have to be based on the IBC, uh, International Building Code, IBC, I kind of like to shorten it. Um, and the fourth technology is we are a stage. So we, have, we need to integrate all the scenic components to deliver the concert and the live event. So that's kind of the specialty of our product is we're not only a stage that is being assembled, we are uh, the sum of all these four technologies all integrated into a single product to uh, deliver the show. Well, and, and the reason that I wanted you to kind of go through that is not only just so folks can get a little bit more familiar about what you guys do, but also just so that people can understand the, the kind of massive amounts of the different types of risks that can be involved when we're dealing with these types of stages. You know, all of those different levels that you talked about, whether it's, you know, the smaller ones to the larger ones where, you know, again, now we're, now we're mobile and we're driving down the road and they've got to move from one place to another. There's all of these different risks along the way. Can you speak to some of those different ones that maybe might not be the ones that immediately pop into planners minds of like, Oh crap. I never thought about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the things that you guys run into the most as far as the, you know, that, that Oh crap moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I'm just uh, looking back at my last week uh, <laughs> uh, to give you a couple examples uh, this past weekend, we were in Toronto doing a big EDM festival called Veld V E L D. And uh, so one of the one of the artists had to put up a banner on for their performance, which I'm sure event planners you deal with artists, you deal with putting like performances together, so you know all about their branding and what it is they want to do for their act. Well, it turned out that their banner wasn't um, NFPA 701, so fire retardant, and we're outdoor. It wasn't secured properly for whatever reason, and it flipped onto a light fixture caught on fire. So we had a fire on stage this past weekend that burned afterwards some of our material that is uh, fire retardant on our end. So that's kind of a good news. So the fire has been able to stop. But uh, so that's kind of like that's one example to answer your question that is fairly recent that I'm still going through the insurance claim with the I'm <laughs> sure. promoter. I'm sorry, I just dropped something here. So with the promoter um, to figure out who's going to pay for what. Um, this past I got a week, feeling there's going to be a lot of finger pointing on that one as far as yeah. who's fault yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah. This past weekend, uh, we were on to another event site here on an island. So island and wind are, uh, they kind of come together normally. Uh, so we were in high wind alert for the entire weekend. We had over 40 mile per hour wind throughout uh, three days. So securing all of the moving elements, so all, the, all of the lighting structures in the roof, you need to have a plan for that. All of your LED screens, um, we were out there for, um, who was playing? Uh, Lord, the weekend, and um, Muse. On over the course of three days, were the three headliners, so they were all, all pretty heavy on video. Uh, so securing the large video screen in the wind is another big uh, important safety elements to consider. Um, so that's this past weekend. What else? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, well Oh, go quick, ahead. Follow, quick follow up yeah. on that, Laura, and then I'll let you yeah. get to your question. And that's uh, so. I mean, you've mentioned wind now a couple of times, and I imagine, especially out uh, outdoors, that's going to be a big factor. So I would imagine wind and lightning would probably be the two the two biggest things that that get in the way. How big of an issue does that happen? Does that um, is that for for mobile event stages in particular, but all outdoor stages? Well, it's, not, it's now a part of our reality. There's been like several accidents in the past years involving staging structures. Um, none of stage line, knock on wood, we're, we're doing everything we can on our end to prevent that. Uh, and we're building our structures accordingly. But it is part of our reality. 
Uh, if you do anything outdoor nowadays, you need to rely on the help of professional meteorologists to help you forecast what's coming your way. So we use on our end a company called Weather Ups. Uh, they have a, a great app, and you also have you're also in contact directly with live meteorologists for all of your shows 24/7. They pinpoint the weather not for the region of the city where your event takes place, but for the exact GPS location where your event is. So therefore, you're they're able to tell you, okay, well, we know exactly where you are. We know exactly what's come. Well, not exactly, because it's always a bit of rocket science when it comes to uh, weather forecasting, but um, or dark science. Who knows what these guys are doing? Um, <laughs> and. Um, so yeah, so you need to have that as part of your plan. So if you if you are doing anything outdoor, uh, wind, lightning is a big component to deal with, and you can't really assess it on your own. You need to rely on the help of professionals, and the services are available out there. Uh, so it's just a matter of putting that on your on your checklist. All right, cool. We're outdoor. Do I have the help of someone that is a real pro? that if the shit really hits the fan, you'll be able to tell me what's coming our way. And also, if it really gets bad, then at least you've done everything in your due diligence and in your power to protect your audience. And therefore, if it, again, goes to court for whatever reason, then at least you're somehow covered. You didn't, guess, like, you didn't guess it on, on, your, on a radar on your own. So that's yeah. something you can really avoid doing. Um, I have a follow-up question to that one situation you described about the the banner catching on fire. If yeah. I'm a planner and this is my very first conference or event or it's, you know, all outdoors and I'm watching it unfold, what is the first thing I should do? Who should I, like, should I secure the audience? Do I, like, what, how do you kind of wrap your arms around that that problem as it's unfolding? You just run. You book yourself a flight for, <laughs> for somewhere far, and you change the name. That's easy. So just have a bit of cash secured on the on a separate bank account. You'll be good to go. <laughs> but uh, securing, like, if you're doing any sort of events, you should already have like a, a risk assessment plan in place. So mm -hmm. that should be somewhere. Well, fire protection is kind of a basic. It's almost like number one in any any event. So you should have that already covered in your operational plan. But yes, securing the audience is always the people on stage, people at risk, securing the audience, and then killing the risk afterwards, killing the fire. Not necessarily killing the people that started the fire, <laughs> but fire. You might want to do that, right. but you, you probably you might shouldn't. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So kind of on the same vein, um, Maybe tell us a little bit, well, actually kind of like switching gears a little bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the difference between a typical roof stage system structure and one of the uh, stage line structures that you all create or build? Yeah. yeah. So a conventional staging structure is uh, what we're used of, of seeing uh, or what we've seen in the past years that that is still used a lot indoors uh, in the event industry whenever you do something with traditional uh, scaffolding and four by eight decks and you build it from the ground up and then you put your trusses up with like uh, base plates corner blocks and you basically build yourself uh, a grid on which you're gonna fly your event uh, so this is the conventional world. What we did on our end is we were doing, well, we come from that world, basically. As promoter, the, the founder of our company was a concert promoter, and he used to build a lot of these stages. So at one point, he was tired of, if the show's nice, we'll do it outdoor for the festival. But if the weather's bad, we're going to dismantle everything, and we're going to pull it in the arena. So it didn't make any sense for him at one point, and he thought of a a more efficient solution that would be built faster, uh, more efficiently with less people. So therefore, he created a machine. And putting the criteria into the design of the machine to make it simple with a lot of uh, redundancy safety features built into the product itself. So when you build it, it's built in, it's deployed in a sequential kind of format. So you can't go from A to C. You need to do A, B, C get to C and B 
the, the step B being a mandatory step. So it also reduces the potential for human error in the process and making it a little bit more well, easier, intuitive, or efficient is kind of the, the word I like to use. So on our end, we built those machines that are hydraulically deployed, and I talked about the four technologies beforehand, um, and that that's what we put our main focus on and started small with smaller stages and built, uh, built it up based on our client needs over the course of uh, 30 years now and uh, made it a business. Very cool. Are there, I mean, by, by doing it that way, are there inherent safety advantages by, by using this kind of, you know, mobile kind of, uh, you know, automatically deploying technology as opposed to, like you said, the old school Lego version of block, 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 putting it yeah. all together that way? Well, we are uh, very heavy on our end. So the, the, the structure itself requires a lot of a self-weight just to be, uh, just to, to live sure. on the road. And then to be transformed into a stage, so we uh, require very less, um, very minimal ballast or external dead weight support to be anchored to the ground. So all of our structures uh, itself, like the core of our structures, are all self-supported and self-ballasted. We don't need to be anchored to the ground compared to the conventional system using either ballast, so concrete blocks, water ballast, or really anchors that are anchored to the ground. Uh, that makes it a lot faster, uh, not fa well, yeah, faster for sure, but safer in the erection process because while you're building until you're fully up and fully blocked in place, assuming you do everything 100% correct, well, that process, that transition process of setting it up, there's always a little more risk with a conventional structure compared to a, a, nitro a mobile hydraulic stage where you're secured all the way through the, the start all the way to the end of the setup. So, so that would be one point to answer your question. One point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, and then once it's up, I imagine there's probably some safety as well, just because it, it is all one structure, and there's there's going to be fewer points of failure. I mean, I, I'm just kind of guessing based on what I know of it, but. Correct. Well, there's that, and there's also all of the safety factors that are put into the the machine. So the the machine being pre-designed and always kind of. Uh, operating under the same criteria are um, are built the same way. So, I mean, you know what you're getting, you know the capacities are predefined uh, rather than building something from scratch with the, the Lego process of a conventional system could work very, very well. And I'm not denying their technology at all because, I mean, we use it from time to time and it's, it's needed and it serves its purpose, but it's just different in terms of how it's assembled. Um, so there's less chance for human error, uh, human mistakes, if you forget a pin or something, or if you don't necessarily tie something well together. Uh, there's very uh, less potential for human error using our machine compared to building something from scratch that is really human labor intensive compared to, to our solution. And on that same note about, um, you know, kind of like what's better for a planner to kind of look out for when they're sourcing um, a staging company. Um, can you maybe go into a little bit more about what a, uh, a planner should be looking for when they're selecting a supplier, but particularly when it comes to safety? Yeah, well, uh, I should have put together actually a checklist, but uh, engineering documentation for the product, uh, proof of maintenance also for the product because all of the stages that are used out there are actually um, machines uh, that needs to be maintained and serviced on a regular basis. So it's like anything else if you don't like maintain the brakes on your car at one point even if you bought the best car ever 10 years ago it's going to fail later down the road. Uh, so proof of maintenance and uh, that they're able to supply or at least certified that they've maintained maintained it and put their names and attach it to it, uh, and their liability and attach it to it is what I meant. Mm -hmm. uh, then their safety plans, including their eye win action plans, is another big criteria. And then their track record: what have they done? Like, um, do they have also all of the 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 documentation in relation to their product? Are they able to tell you the capacity and the characteristics of all the products that they're providing? 
are they able to, to send you those technical drawings in a timely fashion? And uh, what sort of response are you getting from them? Like, do you get this like instantly, or you have to chase and you have to run after it for for four months? If that's the case, that probably means they're not in control control of what they're doing and delivering. That should also raise a trigger and an, another alarm signal. Um, so I guess that's it's that simple, really. I, I would like it be more complex than that. But <laughs> yeah. So that's a good red flag for why a planner should not choose a particular company is that they don't really have any of that safety documentation readily available. Oh yeah, for sure. If they're yeah. not able to provide you with all these documents, instantly, mm -hmm. well that's a red flag. That's a huge yeah. red flag. Are there any other red flags that planners should be aware of? I mean safety is, uh, the safety documentation is obviously a, a huge one, but um, anything else, maybe when the planner is doing a little bit of their research and they're calling um, companies, um, I mean, what other red flags should they look out for? Um, a French-speaking salesperson like me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't know, getting good references, referrals from people that have worked with the, the company and that are able to say, yeah, we've worked with these guys. It is great service, great job. It's been awesome. So that's another that's another good pointer. Um, but no, really, uh, in terms of red flags, I don't there, I don't see anything. I don't, I don't that's want. something that that's something that gets skipped so often in our industry mm -hmm. on so many points. Like whether uh, all kinds of vendors, whether it's AV or technical or even catering and linens and things like that, is people just seem to not go down that road of getting those references and really just ask, hey, can you just let me know who your like, you know, previous three clients were so that I can just have a quick conversation with them and make sure they were happy. Mm -hmm. um, and when you start to go down, you know, when we're talking about people's safety, and we're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of equipment being hung above people who are worth a lot more than the three of us combined, uh, especially when we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, concerts and things like that. Um, you know, it's really important that you, you actually have those conversations with people. So I think that's one that gets, uh, I think, under underutilized a lot, unfortunately. I forgot one also, Brent. That's a really good point that you're bringing, and it brought me uh, like I had a flash. If you can't get their certificate of insurance with all of the requirements that are requested on every show, that's a huge red flag. Like if, if if they're not willing to go ahead and like add your show on as an additional insured on their COI that they're sending out, that's a, that's a huge red flag. Yeah, because I mean it's it's a requirement to do any sort of real operation staging operation in our in our industry. So that's also another trigger checklist. Do I get? Can I get their COI? And just peripheral to that. That, that whenever we're dealing with rigging, um, especially if a venue is forcing you to use their venue, their their vendor, uh, whether it's staging or rigging or anything like that, and you're being asked to use their vendor, it's incredibly important then to get that certificate of insurance to get your event, like you said, put on their insurance as an additional insured, um, and not the other way around. <laughs> uh, so so just be sure that 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 all of that paperwork is in order, especially when they're the ones that's requiring you to uh, to use their vendor. Yeah, definitely. Um, hey, I'm going to take this moment to let uh, the folks who have logged on, thank you everybody for joining us on this episode of Event Icons. If you all have a question, uh, please be sure to use the question panel, and uh, we will get Pierre to answer any of your questions about uh, event stages and structures and everything in between. So uh, be we sure to use that question questions. panel. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, here is a great question. Um, tell us about a client, and they can remain anonymous, um, who overcame a potential safety issue at an event. You did tell us the one about the um, banner catching on fire, but did you have maybe another recent situation where you all caught the, the situation early? That's a... Um... Really good question. I mean, what we deal with all the time, and that's a bit boring because it kind of runs in circle, but it's always like win. Win and lightning is always our big thing. Mm -hmm. 
this past weekend they had to shut the show down for about two hours here in Montreal uh, on that same island where on that same island where the show was taking place because lightnings within the six lightning strikes within a six mile radius um, on our end every summer we see that all the time we did a show in the Midwest this season where we had hail about the size of baseball uh, balls coming down um, Nothing that can really be prevented, um, but I mean, besides using the help of a professional meteorologist service, as I mentioned earlier, um, we still see a lot of last-minute like rigging add-ons onto our structure. So we get, we always on our end require, require like a the rigging plan in advance that is pre-approved, and we put that as part of our engineering package. So we still see a lot of last minute requests on stage, people showing up, oh yeah, we forgot to mention, we also have that that extra piece set that we want to fly here and it's only like 600 pounds, don't worry about it. Uh, we did it all, the, we do it all the time, like you really don't have to be concerned with it. Well, so those last minute changes that you see uh, that are still happening can be a huge problem for your show if they're not handled properly. Uh, or at least analyzed properly. So we still find some of those situations and if you don't train your personnel properly, oh, that brings me to another point, training, we'll touch base on that in a second. If you don't train your personnel properly out in the field to be able to, to empower them to say, well, you know what? It's not on the plans, it's not approved, so I'm not saying we can do it, I'm just saying we have to triple check it, we have to call it in, we have to make sure that we go through the same process and that we certify whatever else you want to add into the roof to make sure that we do not overload any of the structure uh, and we do not create a weakness for, for the stage and the structure and the show that will be happening in, the, in a couple hours. Because it could be fine on a static motion, but I mean once the wind picks up or if the the, 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 the rigging motor that pulls it up, uh, jams or bumps it up, it multiplies the weight by at least two with that movement and that's where a problem could occur. That all blends itself nicely into a question that came in from the audience which is actually similar to one that I wanted to ask as well. Uh, so the question that came in is what's been the most innovative thing to happen with staging in the past five years and I want to I want to dovetail on that just a little bit and say that there's been some high profile uh, incidents with staging collapsing and things like that. So in addition to what's the most innovative thing that's been happening with staging in the last five years, I'd also like to know what's changing in the industry in, as a result of those kind of high profile collapses. Uh, you know, has anything changed from, you know, are people kind of sitting back going, wow, we really need to reconsider that? Or are things kind of moving along as they always have? Oh, things have changed drastically in, in regards to what's required, what's requested by our customers to put together the event in terms of all the checklist points that we've mentioned and touched based on that we go back, we need to go back on training. Laura, please help me refresh my memory on that in a minute. Um, so getting all these, um, uh, all these documents in line have been requested. We also go, go through third party engineering inspections also on some high profile events so they do not necessarily uh, take our word for granted and they will take all of our documentation and all of our package and send it to a third party engineering fir firm to have a review a second time even though it's already stamped um, so that that came as well uh, in regards to the most innovating um, innovative uh, thing that have happened in the past five years for sure I will preach for my choir, but we have developed in the past five years a new stage model called the SAM 750. Uh, we weren't in that niche of product, of, in that range of stages beforehand, so uh, we had the, um, our biggest stage was a 50x40 platform beforehand, and now we moved into the 70x50 uh, clear opening uh, stage dimension which opens and triggers a full new line of potential acts that could perform on stage. All the e artists and international touring acts can now perform on that product. So that stage is a combination of four trailers that are assembled together in a very creative fashion to create that bigger stage it's with that 200,000 pounds, kind of a minimum, minimum threshold uh, of rigging capacity under the roof. 
So I just had to hop onto the website to look that one up. That is a big <laughs> yeah. that is a big mug. Um, that's, 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 and, it, and you've got them kind of broken down by the number of people it takes to assemble and the number of hours that it takes. Mm -hmm. And that one's that one's listed at twelve people, sixteen hours just to get that one up. But it's it's yeah. Huge. yeah. Well, for a similar structure in the conventional world, I mean, we would ask for about twice twice the workforce and twice the time to assemble it. So what was done traditionally over the course of four days is now done in the course of 16 hours, either on a single day or over the course of two regular eight hours. So it reduces like the, 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 the manpower and the cost of putting these stages together drastically. The video is pretty cool, the time lapse of how it's put together. There's several on our YouTube channels, and I'm, uh, <clears throat> I see that, uh, Laura, you're, you're putting that online as a resource shared. Uh, mm -hmm. Cool videos to check on our YouTube channel. Um, and 12 people might seem like a lot, but yeah, well, compared on, to us. On our product, but really, uh, even our competition, everybody who've worked on it, it, it's hard to deny that it's a pretty freaking cool design and machine on how it's assembled and how it's built. So Ooh, it also yes. allows us to do load loadouts in a much faster fashion. So mm -hmm. if we do shows like this summer, we were at uh, the MetLife Stadium at one point for uh, a show called Summer Jam Hot 97. And um, so the loadout of that show was done over the course of 12 hours in a single day as far as the stage goes. So the show ended at like 11 p.m. on a Sunday night and we were out of the stadium by 6 p.m. the next day. That's full production, sound, lights, video, stage, barricades, crown, everything was out of out of the stadium. For them to turn it around and to, to bring in uh, a monster truck event. So That's cool. a faster time turnaround time allows uh, event planners or stadium to just do more events within the same time period, the same uh, four months of summer we all have in North America. So for those, all those reasons I, reasons, I think it's a pretty cool and innovative product. That's awesome. Um, we have a question in from the audience. Um, the question is, what is the strangest request that you've gotten? From artists? Uh, uh, yeah, way? yeah. Or as far as stages goes? Mm -hmm. Either. Well, both. As far as... <laughs> but e either, both. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll think of both. Artists and reading writers is always pretty funny. It's kind of almost like a, a hobby of mine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as far as stages, I mean, um, people like to push it and do things differently. We did a private concert for Bon Jovi last summer in uh, the backyard of a rich guy uh, on uh, in Jersey right in front of the New York skyline and you wanted to connect the stage to the the canopy covering is 60 guests uh, because in case of bad weather he didn't want to have kind of a six foot of water in front of the stage and in front of the tent where the guests were having dinner he wanted them to interact nicely with Bon Jovi so we see, like, we get those type of requests that are a bit uh, crazy and insane all the time. Um, Rigging-wise, we did a, the, a flying act for Pink this summer as well. So wow. videos of uh, what she's doing. She's doing that in all of our all of our stadium shows as well. But she's flying from downstage center, and they connect cables to the, the lay towers out in the field, and she does a flying act over the audience. Uh, which is which is pretty cool as well. It's also all up, all the, up on YouTube. You could find it. But um, yeah, and as far as art as goes, well, there's there are tons of stories, but uh, not a lot that I want I want to survive on the internet for uh, <laughs> for eternity. You can leave the names out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> You wanted to come back to the training side, so we yeah. want to make sure that you didn't leave that off. Part of the training, uh, part of the checklist, uh, getting certification and certification of the guys that will come to your event to set up your stage. Do they know what they're doing? Uh, and that works for both the conventional world to the mobile hydraulic stages. Should it be Stageline or any other brand out there? 
but uh, the structure is only safe if it's installed co properly and correctly and the kind of the only uh, safe way for, for you guys to know if the guy knows what he's doing and what he's showing up on site is for him to give you his credentials and give you a certification. Is he trained to operate that stage? Is he trained to install it? Does he know what he's doing? And if not, that's another huge red flag. I mean, that's probably one of the biggest along with the certification of the product. I can't, I can't really believe I forgot about that one, but. <laughs> Well, I imagine it's another situation you know, uh, where if you can then reduce the number of people that are having to work on that particular stage. So, it's, you know, getting it down to like, you know, 12 or however many it is as compared to the 50 people that you would need, you know, to put together kind of a more conventional stage. I would imagine that helps with that, that you'd be able to say, okay, we only have these number of people and they're all highly trained and, you know, skilled and all that kind of stuff as opposed to the more people you have to get, you know, the more chance there is that there's, you know, someone who just kind of got in because they're the brother of somebody's sister's roommate's friend. For sure. And we <laughs> we all work in the world of stagehands where, I mean, all of those stages are assembled by guys that are stagehands. It's nothing against them. They're, they're all very cool. Not all very cool, but most of them are very cool and very intelligent and cool people to be around. But they don't necessarily know what it is they're doing in terms of uh, building the stage. They're there to follow direction. So making sure that the guy, the leader giving those directions knows what he's doing and what to triple check and what, what are the weak points and what to pay attention to is it, kind of critical in the equation of putting stages together. Um, we have another question in from the audience here. Um, what is the best way for planners to educate themselves about staging possibilities? Like I know on StageLine's site, it has sort of like basic setups. Um, of you know the different possibilities how big the stage is but um, if a planner maybe doesn't even know what's possible what's what's the best way for them to educate themselves I don't think there's any like online tools that will compare like a stage to another and the different characteristics so rather than other than doing like online searches and like going through the websites that would be my um, Going to conferences, um, there are a couple good, very good conferences that that can help you uh, figure out your best choice, choices of vendors and of uh, suppliers to work with, or at least type of stages. Uh, part of the uh, collapse that um, happened in Indiana back in 2012, if I recall correctly, um, there was a an association called the Event Safety Alliance that was created. Uh, by a gentleman named uh, Jim Digby, uh, who was a tour manager for Lincoln Park. So Jim created this association, as the ESA for Event Safety Alliance, and they also wrote a book, which with uh, which includes um, most of the guidelines for putting together a safe event and creating a safe staging environment. So I would say that the Event Safety Alliance and their book. And you'll, Jim will have to excuse me. I can't remember the name of the book, but I'm sure <laughs> on the website uh, it will be easy to find. It can be downloaded online. So that kinds of that would really, really help a new event planner starting in the industry to get to know the basics of crowd management, barricades, fencing, staging, uh, lighting, safety factors that I should be on the lookout for operational management plan, high wind action plans, all the stuff that we kind of touch based on uh, would be detailed in, in length um, in that book. It sounds like a great resource. We'll try and dig that up and add it to the uh, resources list uh, when we publish this. Yeah. Cool. And then also you mentioned uh, conferences are a good place to get new ideas and find new vendors. Um, are there any that you attend that you would recommend? Well, that event alliance actually created a couple of conferences oh, based okay. on the association. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm I haven't visited their site in a long time, but I'm pretty sure that they will share tons of resources. As far as I know, they have at least two conferences on events that they're putting together. So that could be a good resource from some, for someone starting in the industry, or someone that have a ton of experience but just want to uh, I don't know perfect his knowledge and. Uh, go into detail for certain specific uh, topics, you know, that are really uh, pinpoint. 
Cool. We'll add that to the list. All right. Well, as we wind down here, um, uh, you know, we kind of have our typical questions that we ask basically all of our guests, um, uh, and one that, that that Laura likes to throw in every now and then, and I'm going to steal from her, uh, mm -hmm. which is that um, you know we like to get some idea. I mean, I'm a tech nerd, Laura. I know you like all kinds of technology as well, and Will does when he's around as well. So, what are some of the tech tools that you use to do your job every day? I mean, are you in CAD? Are you in spreadsheets? So, you know, what do you use to kind of get, get through your day as far as technology goes? Um, that's a good question. We, um, I'm really not technically savvy on my end and I really don't like, enjoy, like you saw it took me like 15 minutes to set up my webcam and get my mic to work. No, nobody <laughs> saw that. Nobody saw that. Nobody saw that. It, was, it was seamless. No. It was perfect. <laughs> Everything worked great. <laughs> As far as online tools or softwares, I mean, we have a uh, own proprietary, proprietary software that we've developed internally here to uh, to help us go through our day to day and help us manage the logistics involved with doing 1,500 shows every year. So all the ins and outs, the transport, flights, hotels, uh, tech tech bookings, uh, schedules, client schedules, rigging plans, and all that stuff. So that's all. Um, it's a uh, software that we called Smart because we wanted it to be smart. And, uh, and to help us at least look smart. <laughs> and, uh, so that's it. But I really don't have any, any tools. I'm a, I'm a sports guy on my end. So the tools I use to survive my days are going out for, for a run or jumping on my mountain bike and get, kind of get the, uh, the pressure out. And that's it. That simple. But yeah, no. So it's, it's a good question. I just, have, I just don't have a good answer. <laughs> All good, all good. Um, now, we are, like Brant mentioned, we're actually winding down the, the entire hour. I cannot believe it's gone by this quickly. Um, but we like to close up every show with the same two questions. Um, so uh, my question for you is, if you could only pick one, what is your one tip you have for event planners? That's a good question. I should have prepared for this conference. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Be curious. Be curious. Ask questions. Just ask questions. Ask questions on what's happening, what it is you're getting. Just be really curious and get to know the people you're working with. And like by being curious and asking those questions, you'll start building relationships. And from there, you'll most likely be uh, in a better position for your events. I guess That's that a good one. I like it. For mm -hmm. a guy that didn't prepare, I think you pulled that yeah. off pretty well. Yeah. Has it been said before on any other? No, free? no, it hasn't. So, no, that Beautiful. was deep. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the other one? Was the like, what are you gonna cor corner me with? <laughs> oh, we're, no, 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 we're not gonna corner you with any crazy last question. The last question <laughs> is, uh, do you have any new and cool resources that you want to share? Um, any like websites or blogs, books, gadgets that you've been tinkering with any uh, uh, good books anything uh, like that I get an email from a blog every day called the hustle and for for a tech guy like you Brent you will really enjoy it um, so that that's kind of the the only one of the only cool blogs I'm I'm following um, again I get way too many emails to to be connected to to various blogs um, and other than that websites I uh, I couldn't tell you I couldn't tell you when my day is done and like all my my people are going back home and all my techs are safe doing their their things and I can get away from my emails and my computer it makes me very happy <laughs> is that the and daily email the daily email called the hustle yeah okay just making sure so we can add that to the resource that's list kind of a cool that's kind of a cool like uh, let's stay con connected to what's happening on the economy and like the tech world and cool news Awesome. I can just so you know if you Google if you Google the hustle you get a lot of the dance do the hustle. <laughs> I can find the link and send it your way, Brian. <laughs> we'll, add, we'll, add, we'll add that to the show notes and we'll delete that dance that I just did. <laughs> Well, great. I think we're going to wind it down there. And Pierre, thanks so much. Do you go is it Pierre or Pierre Luke? Which do you prefer? We should have asked that probably at the beginning of the yeah, show. Yeah, probably should have asked that. Yeah. 
Yeah, Pierre Luke's my real name. Is my full first name, but I go with Pierre most of the time. Most of the yeah. time. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate learning more about stage line and the safety side of things, which, you know, seems like one of those things again that kind of just gets forgotten about. That we're, oh, I just need a stage. Okay, who do I hire and get a stage and to get in? <laughs> yeah. So we really appreciate you sharing your insights on that. Where can people find out more about stage line or get connected with you? I know you said you're not a big online guy. Are you on Twitter or anything like oh, that? Oh, yeah, my mar my marketing team is actually so stage line. Okay. Um, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on uh, Instagram, we're on uh, LinkedIn, so we're, we do all the social media thing. Uh, so you can follow us on all any of these platforms and get some nice pictures and videos of where we are, what we do, and like uh, it's always nice, nice content, like some nice video content. We also have a blog, Stage Line Blog, so you can read me there from time to time, or people from my team. So. Very good, very good. All right, well, thanks again for joining us. Laura, what's going on with you these days? Uh, not a lot, not a lot. No? No, no not much. <laughs> I'm going to give you an opportunity to, you know, to plug, plug what's going on with you. Um, let's see, uh, Social Tables just released a freemium version of our diagramming software, so for any planners that need a free diagramming tool, you can head to socialtables.com forward slash planners. Check it out. Very good. And you're on the Twitter, right? I am. I'm at Laura Lopez, but the L's are ones. Mm. Aren't you elite? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, great as always. I've been fun hanging with you and talking today. And then I'm Brant Kruger, and you can find out more about me at Brant Kruger on Twitter and eventtechnologyconsulting.com. Well, I want to thank everybody, all of you, for joining us out there on Event Icons, where you can meet the icons of the event industry. We hope you'll uh, subscribe and join us here every week. Uh, I sure as heck enjoy it, so I hope that you guys do too as well. Um, so please join us here every week on Event Icons. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the Twitter conversation sponsored by Alex Plaxon and Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons. <laughs> All right. That was funny. Great. All right. I hit stop. Oh, I think we oh, double. We oh, double no. Oops. It. I'm going to.